Hyper Wellbeing, a podcast about the startups, technologies, and people driving a brand new healthcare industry. Healthcare for healthy people. Consumer and data driven, emerging as devices, apps, mobile, biology, health, and wellness converge. Continuous prediction, prevention, and optimization paradigm. And now, over to your host, D.S. Dreibra. Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Hyper Wellbeing Podcast. On today's show, we have Ardi Aryan Poor. Ardi is CEO and co founder of Seekster. Ardi is a visionary genomics executive and serial entrepreneur in the biotech industry. Prior to starting Seekster, Ardi launched several clinical and consumer based genetic tests as CCO of Pathway Genomics an SVP of Ambre Genomics that sold to Konica for $1 billion in 2017. He is one of the main architects in launching the first commercial clinical exome sequencing test in 2011, establishing the value of next-gen sequencing in the clinic as a player in the 2013 landmark SCOTUS decision scrapping gene patents, already played an instrumental role in expanding genetic testing access. Ardy received his BS in Biological Sciences from UC Irvine and an MBA from Marshall Goldsmith School of Management. Hello and welcome, Ardy. Thank you so much for having us, Lee. Pleasure to be on your podcast. Well, I kept seeing Seekster. It just kept coming back to me via various channels. And then I took a look and I thought, hey, there's something interesting here and reached out to yourself. And then just before we started talking, you kindly gave me a tour of the platform. And I must say it's much more uh, impressive than I've saw in articles or looking at, looking at the website. I think people really have to see it to believe it or to quite understand how powerful it is and genuinely, genuinely how, how good it is. So I appreciate that demo because it really uh, just, uh, it's the best I've saw. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're so humbled. You know, our, our highly sophisticated engineering team has uh, put their blood, sweat and tears and DNA in making something for the people by the people. You mentioned 25 engineers. So did you, did you set at the outset of Seekster? Like when did you begin it? And did you seek at the outset to solve a uh, medical record interoperability? Yeah, great question. So, you know, we started um, on this venture early in uh, January of 2016. And, you know, we we had the idea for quite some time. Um, it really came upon from the inspiration of, you know, me having my whole genome uh, clinically sequenced um, back in the day before anyone knew what exactly that was. And really understanding that your genome and DNA doesn't mean anything unless it's paired with your electronic health records. And so when we kept digging a little bit longer on how to combine EHR data with your DNA data and obviously adding and layering in fitness data, we realized that, wow, you know, there's some real big problems within EHR data. And so we kind of fell on this accident, you know, path of solving interoperability from a consumer angle and just amazing things came when we kept to that mission of wanting all of our health data in one place so that we can collect, own, and share on our own terms. So if I just read here um, from online, it says, there's never been a platform that brings all health data together, medical records, DNA, fitness, and nutrition in one place. Also, it says, the only health data management platform capable of aggregating, standardizing, and harmonizing all of your health data and allowing you to share on your terms. So what you're saying Seekster is, is it's an data health data aggregator, which includes medical records, DNA, fitness, and nutrition. So is it the only platform? Yeah, currently it is the only pr platform that has the nationwide scale that we have been able to uh, build here and what you just saw. The reason why, um, you know, it is so powerful is because we've been able to include diverse multi-dimensional uh, data and multi-generational data with lots of different features 
that we built for the past three years almost here uh, with the Seekster team. And more importantly, standardizing and harmonizing all this data is actually uh, very difficult to do. And it's, it's what we call, or what I call the dirty work. <laughs> we've done the dirty work that no one, no one company really wanted to do. And we've put a very beautiful, as you just saw, user interface that um, was built based off of all of the advice we got. You from built a fantastic Apple. interface. Thank you so much. Why didn't Apple do this? I mean, when I saw what you showed me, it's like, hey, Apple really should have this dashboard. Yeah, look, we, we love Apple. Who doesn't, right? Um, I think there's people that obviously don't like Apple if they're on Samsung or something, too. So at the end of the day, you know, we wanted to build something that's completely agnostic. And we are fully focused on the mission of you owning your health data, you sharing it. And obviously, you have to have a platform to collect it on. And so how can you have a universal platform if you're just one ecosystem? And at the end of the day, you know, Apple Medical Records is a great program, but it's only for Apple users. And if you're not an Apple user, well, you can't utilize it. Plus, um, I think there's just, you know, a lot of differences between us and Apple Medical Records in the fact that, you know, we're really interested in, you know, um, deploying our technology from a B to B to C standpoint versus um, direct to consumer. And there's various reasons for that. And, um, you know, the main point here is that, you know, we're all about not just the individual, but about families actually, you know, owning and controlling their health data. And that's why we just launched our caregiver view feature which is so important because those are the forgotten heroes in health. I'll jump to the product offerings you've got, but let's just get it clear. So what you're providing is, is uh, high quality, longitudinal match data sets. That's correct. We've created the platform where users, participants, individuals, consumers, patients, um, however way we categorize you know, the people to basically own control and collect their health data. And it gets, you know, put in a longitudinal format where you can actually connect multiple health systems, even if they're not, um, you know, on the same EHR provider on the back end, we're able to stitch various different health records together because of the hard work on the harmonization and standardization side on the engineering on the back end that we've achieved. Okay, so is this mainly for sick people? Is that the main market? You know, healthcare today, the, the existing healthcare is, um, well, is for sick people. And hyper well being is about prediction, prevention, and optimization, which needs to become a, a vast new healthcare sector. So I can understand this is. Very good for those who've got large medical records, i.e. are very sick, and it's more useful the sicker you are. Would you agree with that? Yeah, obviously, I think there's various different use cases because when you can control your personal health data, then you obviously have more options. And since we really, you know, created the platform that lets you collect you know, own, organize, and share all of your medical records, DNA, fitness, wearable information, really all in one place, which there never has been a platform to bring it all together in one place so seamlessly. The chronic ill uh, folks and people who are sick definitely have immediate utility with something like this to help them fight, obviously, their illnesses. We're all about empowering patients with various different, you know, illnesses. Yeah, that sounds but, uh, very health 2.0 because health 2.0 is about taking the current paradigm and digitizing it. So, hey, we have sick people, so we make discharge reports easier or billing easier or ambulance rides easier. I can definitely see where like an oncology patient badly needs uh, this product. So they're not walking about buildings uh, with an MRI disc, uh, for example. That's right. And look, I think you hit on a huge point there. You know, 
Um, obviously, within oncology, you can get, you know, you want to get second opinions. You want to share your information with loved ones. And then obviously, you want to contribute to cures too. So there's lots that lots of opportunities that open with a platform like this. And, um, you know, your health information can be a matter of saving life or death, really. And it's key to your care. And so the more information about your health, the better off you are. And uh, there's just various different use cases that uh, fit into the, the chronic illness. But getting back to the healthy people, I think we've built something that also hits on the healthy side. And obviously, you know, most people are healthy first and then they become sick. Well, I would so, say, yeah, well, uh, I, most of the population shouldn't be sick. Unfortunately, uh, more than half of America has metabolic syndrome, if, if measured properly. So because of the way we're eating and living, we are, uh, most of the population is actually diseased, even if they're not expressing uh, symptoms that are plaguing their life yet. But healthy isn't really healthy today, if that makes any sense. People who consider themselves healthy are just saying, hey, I don't have uh, symptoms that are causing me, are noticeable and causing me distress. So that's what, we, what we're labeling healthy at the, at the moment. That's right. And I think this is exactly why we need a dashboard for our health. And, you know, we have dashboards for our finances. We have dashboards for our cars, how much, you know, oil you got in your you know, car and uh, how much gas and how fast do you go? And we've never had dashboard for our health. We, you know, for our net health, how do you measure our own net health? And there's so many wearables and direct to consumer DNA testing offerings. And obviously all this data being siloed, all we're doing Lee is shedding light on this dark data matter so that you can have not just a 30,000 square foot per perspective, on your data, but you can actually drill down and get granular to various different things within your health. Data. Well, I actually, I think the future of health is data. And I see uh, in, in 2015, I could see that there was a third computing revolution underway. And that is when uh, man and machine are converging and the convergence of uh, humans and machines is producing a new data class. Mm -hmm a class I coined intimate data because it's uh, it's wider than just health data. So if I, I read you how I coined uh, intimate data, it is data that is captured from within body, on body, proximal to body, or from sensing and quantifying attributes of our life and lifestyle, all of which impact our well-being. That's the definition of uh, intimate data. And I think the intimate data is going to become uh, the foundation of, uh, it could even go as far as a global economy if we move the global economy to uh, be more in align with well-being. Because if an economy isn't there for well-being, I don't know what an economy is there for. So I recognize this new data class. So what you're saying is you also see the rising importance and availability of I don't want to say health data because this is lifestyle also and also like uh, emotions, you know, via effective computing. So you also see this uh, individuals gathering more and more data, not just episodic data, but continuous data. And so you're building a company to aggregate that data. Uh, yeah, you. I think you hit it right on the nail on its head. It's actually that we are, you know, enabling people to gather their baseline uh, data, episodic EHR data, and continuous monitoring data. Yeah, you're all just in trying to hit people where most people understand today. The people who are probably most driven to use this to begin with, I imagine, are people who are having to go around multiple institutions, etc., or don't want to keep writing down a piece of paper what the doctor said or what tests they had, which people do. So I imagine that's more of the current market, but I do see you longer term being an even bigger uh, aggregator of what I'll call continuous data. That's right. Yeah, I think there's some immediate you know, pain points that we're just able to solve by just you know, having all your passwords you know, not 
dissociated in one place. You know, not that that's why we built the platform, but uh, you know, the, the magic that happens on the back end with the matched longitudinal data from various different sources is really the power of Seekster. And we keep, you know, um, uh, pouring more uh, effort into making that even stronger by adding more institutions, more data points, more wearables. So the more you can pull in for these individuals, the better, obviously, those yeah, data sets all, are. Obviously, the network effect. That's right. When I first looked at Seekster, I assumed it was just doing electronic medical records plus genomics and nutrition and uh, wearables, etc. But when you gave me the demo, I could see that I could also have lab results. Now, can those lab results be from the likes of LabCorp or Quest that I order directly, like direct-to-consumer type relationship, I not through a medical institution because I was sick to begin with? That's right. Yeah. So if you if you have ordered um, something from LabCorp or Quest, we can pull that data in just like how we just showed you a couple of minutes ago. Um, it doesn't have to come directly from the institution. We built the technology uh, so that we can actually tap in to the various different you know, um, providers. Well, I tell you and how could- I'm working at the moment, which isn't great. So it's why I've got interest uh, in, in your company is I am using spreadsheets or Airtable mm-hmm. to store my um, health data. And it's not very nice trying to match up timelines, etc., or swap units over or having to input data from PDFs into a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't give that robust feeling. And it's kind of a bit dirty when you share it because you've named the columns how you wanted them, et cetera. I just wanted something where ideally it would have a concierge service, where if it was a PDF, I could just email it. Um, But, you know, I can accept typing in myself. But I wanted something that would convert the units you know, because different labs use different units, so it would unify it. And I'd want something that was guaranteed robust storage, i.e. you're not going to disappear. And even if I stop paying, I can still export my data. That's right. Yeah, I think I think it goes back to the standardization, right? And the reason why, you know, we're able to enable all of the points that you just mentioned is because of the standardization data that happened on the back end. And, um, you know, obviously having one secure place where it is housed digitally is what's important so that you can actually take it wherever you are. The same way that you have, you know, your photos, obviously, that are so important to you digitally on the cloud, right? Um, It's the same way. Something seems quite odd here. And I always imagined that it was a role of government uh, to house such data. And I just get the complete impression this is not the future. It's not what's going to happen. It is going to be the likes of your private enterprise. Yeah, that's actually a sad thing. I think, you know, our government should have done this for us in the first place. Um, Obviously, the NHS is as close as you get to any place, I think, in the world that you know, has provided something where they haven't even provided anything like Seekster, but it's much better than, you know, the United States' um, uh, healthcare system <laughs> where our data is so scattered and siloed. But you're right. I think we've created something that really um, can even empower our government. Um, yeah, Maybe I'm they should give us in the private enterprise um, space, but look at, um, com- com- look at space uh at the moment as in spacex yeah i'm I'm shocked that that's in the private sector but the private sector is uh what should we say doing exceptionally well with it as you know performance and cost i I think there's a reason for that tell me yeah i I think the main reason is the silver lining of you know um startups and entrepreneurs and visionary folks move fast And, you know, the government has bureaucracy and red tape and 
by the time they want to do something like Seekster, it'll be like 2035 and they'll waste, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, not, you know, getting to where they need it to be, where, you know, you can take a ninja team of 25 people, spend two, three years of your life and actually create something, you know, that can be for all of us. The perfect company to acquire Seekster. I know you're just out with Stealth, I think, in February this year. So you might not be thinking about this, but I would say it has to be Amazon. Uh, no comment. I think there's lots of tech companies that you know would be uh, wanting to take a look at what we've created, but um, you know uh, we want to build the the best uh, platform and company uh, there I, is. I, I just, and this ha- in my opinion, this has to go large at some point. So when you gave me that demo before we hit record, uh, you clicked on Glucose. And yeah, it was harmonized. And what I mean by that is the person you showed me had been tested at different points in time by different providers, but yet the graph just uh, consolidated that. So it just appeared magically as if it had been from a single provider with no effort on the user um, user front. That was very nice. Yeah, that we call that the Gutenberg moment. <laughs> and I think that's what really... Uh impressed Dr. Eric Topol. Um, and that's why uh, he really uh, was kind enough to share his health data on Twitter because he was able to see, you know, all his health data uh, all the way back to 1985. But it's a fact that matches up the data points. You know, you don't quite yeah, know exactly. you so, see it. Yeah. And, and, and it's so hard, obviously, for the audience to understand, you know, what you and I are maybe talking about. But most people have more than one health system. And if you have, let's say, a cholesterol or blood pressure data point from more than one health system, how do you put that on one chart? Yeah, exactly. And that's it's what just, it's just too much work. That's why after years of it, I'm still hacking away uh, using spreadsheets and never fully completing them. Plus, I like it more on my mobile device and immediately available. Anyway, I was going to, because I need to get off spreadsheets, I was going to use a company, a small company called headsuphealth.com. Then I noticed that they seem to pivot, at least in their homepage, and more make out that they're for keto, which I guess is a, a good market, a ketogenic diet support. But they are also an aggregator the claim of all your health data. So are you aware of headsuphealth.com? Yeah, we, we are uh, very familiar with, I would say, all the players in this space. Other than that, we wouldn't have been experts with what we built. And, uh, you know, one thing to note is there's a lot of me too's and there is a lot of various different companies out there uh, saying that they can do what we, you know, built but the when once you look under the hood, you'll realize that they're using other technologies with just a front end wrap where we have actually created the technology of what I just showed you in house. Um, that's where the value of Seekster is. We have proprietary technology versus using something that's already out there like human API. Or, so do you think you know, Heads Up Health other. are using human API? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We know they are. I wasn't aware of them. Hey, back, I remember back in 2008, Google launched Google Health. And that was also to give you access to your health records. But Google discontinued that because nobody used it in 2011. But Microsoft also have their health vault. Um, And as you know, Apple also have their health records. But I think Microsoft Health Vault is the same. It just doesn't store genomic information, if I'm right. Yeah, you know, I think um, what's interesting about this whole um, arena from Google Health to Microsoft Health Vault to Apple Medical Records is the fact that, you know, their their timing uh, of, of getting out was not um, ideal. And they were taking a different approach. Um, They weren't taking a real consumer approach to things. Obviously, um, uh, you know, Google Health shut down and then I'm I'm not sure if they're doing anything uh, yet or maybe they will be because Apple's getting into it, obviously. And Microsoft has, you know, something with Health Vault that's for businesses 
it seems like. It looks like it's more of an enterprise type of thing, but you don't hear much about it. And um, they haven't actually harmonized and standardized health data on the back end from what we know. Yeah, I've never saw so, it. So I just wondered if they had done uh, uh, super cool stuff you were showing me. <laughs> the, the normal, yeah, up to our knowledge. Um, but those same simple words yeah. until you see them. But hey, so I, I didn't know. I tried to get a login for Microsoft uh, Health Vault and it didn't seem to go anywhere. Right. And, and we've done the same. I mean, up to our knowledge, they have not. And another thing to differentiate actually between all of these players and us, including Apple, is again, the fact that we have nationwide coverage of close to 3,000 hospitals integrated into c How did you get that? How did you get the hospitals to agree to them? Yeah, so, you know, we built the technology where, you know, we concentrated on McKesson, Cerner, Epic, all scripts. So the major electronic medical record providers. That's right. And we standardized and harmonized all that data on the back end because, um, you know, even if you have one Epic provider from UCSF down to UCSD to, let's say, you know, an- another provider that uses Epic, um, it, it's it's not the same version. So there's various different versions of the EMRs or EHRs. And so we we came from the genomics, you know, background of your DNA it doesn't change when it comes from one lab to another. So if your DNA is coming from 23andMe or Ancestry or whatever, they're all RS numbers. If they're SNPs, it's not changing. And so when we started taking a look at the EHR data, we're like, why is this so scattered? How come it's not all on one level playing field? And so that was one huge advantage we had being, you know, DNA genomics um, entrepreneurs and having had a lot of success um, building companies within that space and just applying that same thinking from our engineering end to the EHR space. Well, and well, why uh, do you we, guess why the institutions it, agreed? Because I read the, um, the great book, uh, An American Sickness, and she makes a very yes. good case that uh, the healthcare uh, sector is very much um, reluctant to share data, and most of it's um, to protect commercial interest. And institutions see the data as uh, an asset which they want to keep control of. So I'm wondering how you got this network up and started. Like, what was your sell point? Yeah. So if you're familiar with Mint.com for finances, we took that same approach of putting you, Lee, the person at the center of healthcare, disrupting those data silos, bringing it together. Because by law, under HIPAA law, you own your health data. And, you know, you can go into any of your, you know, uh, portals and information and yeah, download so, your yeah, raw so data. Is this the patient portal code I hear people talking of, that you can request a patient portal code? If you have gone and seen a physician, by law, actually, if they have a patient portal, you can actually request the code and register so that you can actually download your raw data. But that raw data, unless you're a highly sophisticated bioinformatician um, or engineer, doesn't mean anything to you. So what we've done is we've pretty much automated the process and built a machine you know, uh, learning EHR, I would say, uh, retriever where we're able to, you know, put you again at the center of your health, disrupting the data silos, bringing all that health data together and then visualizing that data, just like how we showed you Seekster at the beginning of this conversation. What about imaging like x-rays, CT scans, MRIs? Absolutely. So, you know, depending on your health system, some are more sophisticated than others. So if that information resides within your electronic health record, then we can, you know, pull that information and display that information for you. If it does not exist, then what we're doing is on our roadmap, we have scanning ability and importing ability um, from the product end being developed so that manually you would be able to um, import and add to your overall 
you know, health information or health records. So do you plan to offer a concierge service where people can give you actually a, 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 a printout and you have people uh, manually enter it? So um, kind of. It's more around the fact that, you know, if you have, let's say, printouts of your labs that were not in a health system or institution where you can actually tap into it digitally, well, how are you going to get that into your full profile? The only way is to actually scan it and, and um, upload it. So that capability um, we are building at Seekster. But what's really important is the chain of custody of data. And so everything we showed you with a click of a button comes from the chain of custody can of data. Can you explain chain of where, custody, please? Yeah, chain of, chain of custody of data is... You know, if I log into, you know, UCSF uh, uh, portal, um, I am seeing chain of custody of data where it's coming directly from the EHR. If I scan my records that I have, how do you know that it's really my records if I put it into my, you know, overall accounts? Obviously, I know it's so mine. That, but is there like, there, is there like a metadata that goes with that chain of custody to prove it? That's right. Yeah. So the chain of custody comes directly the same way that, you know, from finances, it's chain of custody data. It's your bank account. When you add it, it's not like if you add another zero, well, guess what? You're going to be richer, right? In your bank account. So it's coming directly from the source. So chain of custody equals directly from the source, from the provider directly, from the institution directly, from the DNA lab directly, um, from your wearable watch um, you know, or, you know, um, device directly instead of you putting self-reported data or a scan sheet in has different value. It must be quite challenging in the back end having long-term large storage data, i.e. Um, genetic data, and then continuous data coming from wearables. That must be a challenge in the back end because there are, there are massively different data types. One is small and very periodic. Some wearables are sending a lot per second. So that must be quite an engineering challenge in the back end, those two uh, types of data. Yeah. The, in short answer, Lee, we never want to do it again. I mean, if we knew it was this hard, we would have never, I think, began on this venture. But we're so glad that we were able to have an aha moment, a significant technical breakthrough to be able to put it all together seamlessly, frictionlessly, uh, the way that we, yeah, I'd we love to ask to you. you about engineering side of it, but I won't because I know uh, you can't divulge that. But it'd be interesting how you tackled some of that. So I know I remember Apple acquired Glimpse. Uh, I think it was twenty sixteen, and uh, you know Glimpse, if I read it, is is healthcare's platform for patient data. By unlocking patient data silos, we aggregate fragmented data into a patient-owned longitudinal health profile. And so they clearly were aiming at something very similar. And so do you have any idea why Apple don't seem to have moved with Glimpse or at least appears that way? Yeah, I mean, what what I can share with you on that is the fact that, you know, Apple Medical Records um, is a uh, result of, of that acquisition. Yeah, I guess that. It just um, didn't seem to go far enough. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, obviously, you know, if you're Apple, you really care about um, obviously selling more iPhones and iPads, right? That's their business. They're not in our business, in the business of, of, of health. I think there's a lot of players that want to get into the business of health. They're trying to figure out ways, obviously, where they can, you know, monetize um uh, and, and that's, that's the trouble. And so, you know, the Apple medical records is very limited, um, from what it is. And there's, there's lots of ways, you know, that we think that that can be improved. Imagine having Seekster, um, incorporated, you know, with what we just showed you inside of what Apple medical re records is right now. I think it would, it be, would be killer, you know, a huge up. It, it, I think it would be a great future. I think it'd be great for the people and you get more engagement. 
Yeah, so finally on this kind of competitor angle, the only two other companies I know of who have been trying to provide converged uh, medical data is Patient Bank and Picnic Health. I'm I'm not so familiar with those services, but I believe they don't let you add uh, wearable data, i.e. continuous data, and I don't think they allow you to add genomic data. Yeah, that's correct. And I think um, we recently heard that Patient Bank is not even around anymore. Don't count me on, on that, um, but that's what we've heard. So I, we don't know much about them. But uh, in regards to Picnic Health, I think, you know, there's some various limitations there, too. Um, because you can't get chain of custody of the data. Their business model completely different. Obviously, they don't bring all this health data together in one place so seamlessly. In less than 60 seconds, you know, a user can aggregate all their health data using the Seekster technology. And, um, you know, when we say all of their health data, their DNA data, their wearable data, and their electronic health records, where, you know, we tried uh, Picnic Health ourselves for our own families when it first came out and lots of problems, um, you know, with, with their so technology. Seems lots so of people have been trying to uh, tackle it, but what you showed me was working well. And then I saw Eric Topol uh, tweet that within minutes he had connected across four health providers. Uh, and so you seem to have got something working there. Um, what's it, what's the secret sauce? You know, I think, um, uh, we, we've had obviously a little bit of luck. We've just been working really, really hard. And I always give the analogy of if you have, um, a shovel and you keep digging Lee, you know, you're going to find some copper, but if you have time to dig more, you're going to find some gold and maybe you get lucky and you hit the platinum before the gold. That's what happened. And that's where the technical, the significant technical breakthrough on our engineering side came on the EHR end. And then we were able to apply that across multi-dimensional you know, data and multi-source data and you know, layer in, obviously, the DNA and various different fitness wearables and things like that. But more importantly, we stuck to the mission. We have stuck to the mission that we wanted something for even ourselves. And I think good things come when you stick to one specific mission of having all of your health data. Are you in saying one place. that you haven't kept pivoting, that you've been more focused on what you want or need yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it goes back to if you want this to have utility, who cares if you have all your health data in one place? We were asking that question years ago. It's the so what, but it's the fact that now you can share it. Now you can, you know, you know, um, uh, enable remote monitoring and care. We just launched our Let's caregiver. Let's talk about view, the. I think right? you've got three products. You've got Health One, as you're calling it, which is your aggregated view for yourself. I think you've got Health Trust, which is about passing it. This is super cool. We should really talk about this. Passing it between generations, the data. And then you've got, I, I, I am not sure of the name, but it's like health caregiver or something like this, which is so that you can remotely view uh, the health data real time of someone you care about, i.e. typically uh, a family member. Is that the three services? You got it. Yeah. Health One, Health Trust, and Caregiver View. And, uh, you know, Health One is all your health data in one place, that fast, rapid, effortless aggregation. Health Trust, first legal framework for preserving and passing on multi-generational. Cool. So can you can you explain that framework? I, I tell you why this is super yeah. cool, because a decade ago, I suggested to a, a good friend who's founded a few startups, I said, hey, digital objects have value, but there's no legal framework to pass them between generations. You should do that. He, he, he didn't do that. And now what you're doing is what I'd call a subset of that, focused on health. So how did you go about getting the legal framework? Can you explain how it, it doesn't, it, it probably didn't exist to begin with? How, how did you go about that? That was another accident. It was super cool. It's a personal story. No reason to be sorry. But my 92-year-old grandmother passed away in the middle of building Seekster. And when she passed away, Lee, she passed away without passing on her health data to me, my brother, and my mom, the alpha daughter and caregiver of our family. More importantly, Lee, 
she passed away without passing on her health data to you and to everyone listening to this podcast. So we started thinking about, wow, there's got to be some real utility between, you know, not just your own data, but the best thing that you can pass on, you know, isn't your car or your jewelry or your money. That monetary stuff really doesn't have much value. What's really valuable is your health data. How can my grandma and my mom pass on their health data to me and so that I could pass it on to generations down the line to my kids and their kids' kids and so forth? Is that because you so think forth. it will be and used so, as part of the computation for predictive uh, services, i.e. your grandmother or had X, you may have twice as likelihood of, of, of the same? Is it... Getting Alzheimer's. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, from a clinical trial standpoint, multi-generational data is just like non-existent. Oh, so it's a case. It. So it's useful There's never for two things. It's useful for donation to the public at large, and it's of use to you specifically within your family context to know what those who you um, have gene inheritance from. Uh, okay. That's right. And... And I think the biggest thing is that we're able to help society. Like, for example, why, why, are, why, is, why is the NIH trying to do this all of us program? It's so that, you know, you can help the country and society. It's just a bit well, like you know, donating you your 23 and me data. But I guess a lot of people will then, so it is super, super data, this uh, multi-generational data in terms of value. But I guess I have to ask about the business model. So your business model is selling that to third parties? No, that's not our business model. Our business model is, you know, we basically deploy our technology so that, you know, if you're a payer or provider or a pharma company or a foundation, you, if you want to bring value to your members as a benefit tool, then our technology allows that collection, ownership, and sharing of that health data. Now, if between the business parties and the individuals, there's consent where, you know, the users would want to share that data for research or advancing medical science, then obviously that can be enabled. But the users would generate value themselves from doing that. It wouldn't be the same model as, let's say, 23andMe has yeah, currently. Yeah, because that model is, uh, what shall I say? <laughs> Uh, being getting questioned. Absolutely. And for a very good reason, it's been being questioned. It should have been questioned years ago. But I think, you know, society's starting to pick up on, oh my God, this information is valuable and it's my health information. It's my family's information and I should be doing something with it so that my family and I and society can benefit. But, you know, you have to be able to crawl then walk and run. Part of the problem is a lot of people are going straight to the running. And if you didn't crawl first, if you didn't build a collection mousetrap where you can actually, you know, collect data easily and frictionlessly first, you can't ever do all these other great things that, you know, everyone's talking I about. I always find it strange that in hospitals, because... Oh, deep breath. Unfortunately, I had uh, family members in uh, hospitals for a long time, which is partly why I'm uh, doing this podcast. But people in white coats, etc., would come around and take measurements and then scribble them down. But they wouldn't actually share them with you. And they'd be like, well, what is her systolic blood pressure, etc.? I always find that quite strange, very, very paternal when people come around and take measurements. Then when you go home, you don't see those measurements. Yeah, exactly. There's a disconnect between what is being done and obviously what is being spent on what is being done and how you actually benefit from it, you know, on a daily basis. And I think a lot of these things like the wearables that are coming out with new features, the direct-to-consumer testing, all this consumer genomic, consumer wearable stuff is pushing towards this overall arching umbrella of consumer health. I, I remember my event I held in 2016, uh, Walter of uh, Dr. AI, he said that, I am pretty sure he said, 
I want to say don't quote me on this. I'll, I'll put a link to his video. I'm pretty sure he said that he believes that your health, your medical data should reside in your smartphone. What do you what do you think? Uh, you know, instead of having a, a, a cloud provider in the middle, do you think some kind of blockchain decentralized to the smartphone is maybe uh, the model to go for? If you ask any of these companies that have came out saying that they're using blockchain for this and that, where's the utility, we ask? I don't even think they know yeah, much I about it. I saw a few ICOs but, where they were claiming to do something similar, you know, put all your health data together and they were selling tokens. I haven't paid uh, so much attention because I've not saw uh, so many, certainly not health ICOs gain traction yet. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest problem is, you know, when you completely de-identify data, then it's not really worth anything either. When, when you can match to a person and you can get directly to the source of that data set, you know, for security, you know, I think blockchain is great. But from a utility standpoint, I think there's lots of questions that need to be answered. You, you claim to store nutritional data. I, I guess you're getting that from uh, my fitness pal, from their logs. That's right. We have various different um, apps that, you know, obviously had big user bases that we started early on with, you know, um, integration within the Seekster platform. And obviously my fitness pal um, is, is a, a big one. Okay. And in terms of genomic services, is that just, uh, it's not whole genome sequencing services yet, just exome? So we have, um, you know, if you have genotyping results, if you have exome, genome is on the um, roadmap. Any type of DNA data, we can actually pull into uh, your uh, platform. Okay. Obviously, the storage requirement is, is quite a large difference between. Exactly. The, yeah. the storage is way different from genotyping to even exome to all the way to genome. Uh, again, uh, you know, you have to go where the market's at. You have 20 million plus people that have been genotyped via 23andMe and Ancestry DNA and so forth. How many people do you have that have had a genome sequence so far? Not many, right? And so, again, you got to go with where the market is. I'm not saying that, you know, people aren't going to be genome sequenced. At some point, they will be. But I think the genome has hit, um, you know, a halt kind of, and that's due to pricing. Yeah, it's still, I, I think, $800 is the, the cheapest I've saw. I think 23 me or uh, I, I think I heard planning on offering it. So let, let me give you some thoughts on electronic medical records. So my understanding, as I'd mentioned earlier, after reading An American Sickness and, and some other books, was that the electronic medical record had really became the billing record. All it became was instead of being used for patient care, primarily it's mainly for billing. And her book, Elizabeth, uh, her book, says the doctors are told to cut and paste huge blobs because uh, to try and get the the count up because it looks like more it's full of uh, billing codes and i saw a report from stanford this month that said doctors guesstimate that about 30 percent of the electronic mech emr we'll call it is actually about patient care and is actually useful in fact, doctors complain constantly that it's full of junk, cut and paste blocks. And I remember also from that Walter talk from 2016, he said, uh, medical records are not that useful anyway. We can we can get that data with a few measurements, what, what's really important about a person. So, you know, is there that much good information in an EMR? Yeah, you know, I think just like how we showed you, we thought the same until we kept on digging and digging and digging and seeing really what's in there. And there's some incredible information on, uh, you know, your health, obviously, within your EHR, EMR. It becomes more valuable when you get it longitudinally instead of just one snapshot from your last visit. One visit, two visit, even three visits don't mean much. But if you take, you know, Eric Topol's example, when he's able to take a look at all his health data since 1985, yeah, I think anyone would yeah, argue that, that... Because in that Stanford medicine uh, poll that they had, 
Only 3% of clinicians thought that it helped with disease prevention. Only 2 thought it helped with clinical decision support. And only 3% thought it helped with patient engagement. So they only thought um, only 8% of it uh, actually related to clinical matters, which is definitely quite poor. I was wondering, you could maybe use this service to help people, to help consumers with billing to forecast billing or to find cheaper options? Have you, have you thought of that? Absolutely. There is some very unique um, use cases from an ROI standpoint that are coming to us exactly with what you just mentioned. And the reason being is, again, once you have all this health data in one place, there's just so many things that you can do with it and layering in other data that was very easily to get, such as claims yeah, data. Yeah, I want to check right, if I've example. been ripped off or what's this likely to cost or could this have been done cheaper if I wish to dispute the bill? That's right. And, you know, one of the biggest uh, healthcare costs in our country is uh, double MRIs, actually. And so, you know, um, there's, there's a lot that we can do from a saving standpoint that would actually turn into profitability for various different enterprises at the same time, empowering those members to control, own, and share their so data have you on their terms. About, have you thought about uh, making your product a platform and having third parties build apps based upon the data? Yeah, currently, you know, we are again, a B to B to C platform where if you are any enterprise, health plan, payer, provider, pharma, foundation, um, you know, even home health company, whatever enterprise you are that's interested in, you know, deploying this type of technology to your uh, members, we can do that in a nationwide scale basis. We have thought about unique, various different features and apps that we can integrate in there. But we're more interested in building for the customers that are coming to us with their specific pain When points. are you going to be direct to consumer, if ever? As in, I can sign up, for example, without an institution. Our, our barrier is from a customer service standpoint, you know, obviously we don't want to be in the business of direct to consumer just yet. Um, we're in the business of uh, empowering um, a member centric, um, you know, entity to utilize this, and we want to give it to the people who need it most first. And so, you know, um, the marketing obviously is a lot different when you're doing direct to consumer versus. Uh, Have you thought B2B. about doing health recommendations? Because that you need actions on the data. That's where I would. That's a, the flip side. I'm glad you brought that up. Absolutely, we have health um, insights. We call it. We can give you health recommendations you and insights today. once we have. Absolutely, we can do that today. And there's there's a fine line on what you want to give and what you can give. Obviously, from a health standpoint. So. Um, you know, because we can get that DNA info, we can correlate, you know, your cholesterol to your, let's say, running activity out of your Apple Watch to your SNP that says, you know, uh, you're a uh, high endurance runner or whatever that, that SNP is relating to. So just some really interesting things from a consumer standpoint that's more interesting then I would say maybe health related. But what's what we found is from our alpha and beta studies, people were finding more information about their health and changing behaviors because of seeing the data. It's not the fact that we can aggregate this data that I think you thought was impressive. If you, know, you go back tomorrow and you think about what we showed you at Seekster today, the visualization of that data I think actually is even more impressive because we've taken something highly sophisticated and made it Can very you simple. Can get the data back out as an export? Absolutely. We could transfer via FIRE. We via can get fire. all raw data in a relational data schema. Fire. 
Yeah, F H I R. Um, it's a format. Oh, I, I'm aware um, of that. I'm, that, you I'm know, busy thinking about like text files, etc. But what what type of format is that? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, uh, Fire is fast healthcare interoperability uh, resource. So nobody's that's what it logged in. For. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and what's nice about that is, you know, from a research standpoint, we enable lots of various different, you know, things, because we don't have a standard that we live by. And, you know, a lot of people live by, you know, an HL7 standard, standard or, you know, various different standards. But at the end of the day, you know, since we standardize and harmonize the data, we can transfer that data as okay, well. I, I think I cut you off a little when you were earlier when you were talking about health trust like about getting the legal framework in place yeah so you know the the health trust again it's the fact that you know my data is worth something on its own but it's my, my data paired with my mom and my grandmother's data is worth a lot more not just to me personally but to society and to various different you know, people that maybe want to research our data. Um, and so the health trust is a very unique way of preserving and passing on multi-generational data. And we worked with um, Wilson Sincini and also Paul Hastings, our, our, our lawyers, to make this happen and some co-chairs of policy under HIPAA um, in D.C. And it's, it's just a very unique uh, legal framework mechanism that we built in. And it wouldn't have been possible if we didn't build Health One first. And so, you know, going back again, you got to crawl, walk, run. The crawling was Health One. The walking was Health Trust. And now the running is, you know, um, the caregiver so view is an example, right? This caregiver view is kind of, you know, is classic. I'll again, call it Health 2.0 where, hey – you can see the health of a family member and, you know, kind of see your elderly mother, which I'm, I don't mean a mock. It's just, it's a, you know, it's a touted uh, user case and it's a valid one. And this system does seem good for that from what I saw. And yes, it's certainly useful to be able to log into a dashboard and see, for example, uh, elderly parents, blood pressures, etc. But for hyper well-being, my excitement would be more along the lines of, as a family unit, you can see each other's health. You know, father can see mother, mother can see father, F uh, parents can see children or teenagers, etc. And so you can see each other's health, not just, oh, someone is old, so they're probably a bit sick, so we better monitor them. But actually, hey, let's, let's keep a, a track on each other's health, just like you visually do anyway. Hey, you look a bit white today. Are you okay? Are you eating well? Don't you see a future where this transparency of your family members, it, a little bit like Facebook, Facebook let us see what our family are doing day to day, even if we're not even geolocated with them. Don't you think that this transparency will work in knit social structures and just, I just think it'll culturally change, just like we tweet what we're doing, I, our Instagram. I, I can't help but think that in close knit, strong social ties, will be aware of each other's heartbeat, et cetera. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, again, I we've accidentally fell on this visionary, you know, uh, road of taking health data to a whole nother level. And including the families was just an eye-opener to us where, you know, it's not just about tracking and monitoring your loved one's health, but coordinating care. There is that, but that's for old people. But don't you think that you assume most of the family as well, if we're talking the health care I'm talking about, not this sick care, which is all we have at the moment, but under the hyper well-being banner, I say another health care is emerging, which is for, quote, healthy people. Don't you think it will be normal to see the physiological measurements of family members or hey maybe they had an irregular heartbeat and you you get to see it in your dashboard don't you think it'll be normal to share that real time just like we share instagrams 
you know, because it's health data, maybe you won't share it publicly, um, but you would share yeah, it within, within your family. Social ties. I can't help but think that within those strong family bonds, it's going to become normal to share that data, like to have Absolutely. that data flow. And I think that's Absolutely. a big change to culture. I actually think it could be on the order of having a camera built into a phone. You see how that changed culture. I think it could be of that order. It, it definitely can be, and I think that's where families will learn more then, about yeah, their you, health histories as well. And then you become well. more concerted as a family maybe to eat better. And mobile phones are going to be gaining more biosensors, and so each family member is gaining more data. So this is kind of exponential. It's so true. It's so true. Whether we like it or not, Lee, everything is going towards health data one way or another. I mean, um, you know, even counting your steps – on your phone count as health data. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and that's why I uh, uh, came up with that term, uh, intimate data. Let's see if I can find that just before we uh, close out. See, I also had said back in 2015 that intimate data is increasingly derived, I'm quoting here what I said in 2015, increasingly derived from across our entire lifetime, approximately 28,000 days. Already, apps, devices, and wearables are capturing our physical and even sexual activities, motion and gestures, sleep, reproductive cycles, stress, energy levels, nutritional intake, and increasing physiological measurements. This was a splash page I put up in 2015 for the event uh, I did in 2016. But clearly, something is happening I don't think enough people are paying attention to. So when I put their you know, your fitness trackers can work out sexual activities algorithmically. Uh, we've got T-shirts at measuring your motion and your gestures. We know we have more and more sleep measurement. We know we have apps and no reproductive cycles. We know we have ever sophisticated stress measures. We know we're getting clinical biosensors coming more and more to the consumer. We know we're measuring energy levels. We know there's an expanding array of vital signs and medical measurements coming. I'm often quite lost. Uh, I just don't see the excitement that there. I feel there ought to be the past few years in this new data sector. I mean, you know, everything that you just said, you know, puts a smile on her face. And that's exactly why we think everyone is a seekster, but they just don't know it yet. Everyone is seeking more information about their health and their loved one's health. And that's the simplest way to actually put it and all I think together. Already. That's a perfect place for us to sign out. I really appreciate, unless you've got anything else to say, I really appreciate you kindly taking the time to give me a product tour and answer the questions I had. Is there anything uh, you'd like to say before we close out? Um, no. If anyone wants more information, um, they can email us at info at Seekster.com. You can also follow us on our Twitter, at Seekster. And again, Lee, um, very much thank you for reaching out and having us on your on your show. Um, I it's highly been a pleasure uh, talking appreciate to you. your time. And I, I want to wish you luck, but I don't think luck is the right thing because I don't think you're needing luck. I think, uh, I think you know you're onto something. You know what you're doing. And I'm sure I'm going to keep seeing you in the, in the news. Thank you so much. We'll always take some Lee luck. <laughs> okay, some Lee luck. Thank you again. For more information, please see hyperwellbeing.com or follow Twitter at hyperwellbeing.